So welcome to this edition of the of That Catholic Saints Guy. Uh, I'm Brian O'Neill, your host, and I'm with uh, Father Christopher uh, Finley Wilson. And uh, we're, today we're going to discuss a woman who I'm really just amazed is not already a saint, and certainly uh, even more amazed that she's not at least better known. And that is Teresa Higginson, who's a servant of God, died in 1905, and Father uh, is going to tell us her story and why she deserves to be a little bit better known amongst Catholics and indeed amongst all people of goodwill who are trying to uh, walk with Jesus Christ and um, know, love, and serve God in this life so we can be happy with him in the next. Uh, so, uh, but Father, do me a favor, start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, please. Oh, well, um, I had a fairly ordinary uh, upbringing, happy upbringing. I uh, had three brothers, four of us, uh, grew up in a small town in the south of England. And uh, um, both my parents uh, were, took their faith seriously, Catholic faith, which I suppose is slightly unusual nowadays. Um, we used to say the rosary every day, every evening. And uh, Great. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, re I remember my, my mother telling me when we were in our teens that uh, she'd found it very lonely, my parents, in the 1960s, because all, all their Catholic friends had started using the pill, and uh, they said, no, we've got to stick with the Pope's teaching, we've got to stick with the Church's teaching. Even their parish priest had told them it would be okay, and they said, no, we've got to. Really? So they were quite brave, really. Yeah, and, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, and then I went off to university, and uh, up in Scotland, in St. Andrews, and where I encountered um, one of the uh, two UK-born new movements called the Faith Movement. And I was very impressed by these students who were uh, articulate and bright and funny and normal and uh, loved their Catholic faith. And some of them went off to be priests. And, uh, and I guess that's uh, when I thought about it myself, really. And I was fantastic. I have the brother who's a priest as well. So that's awesome. Your parents are hitting fifty percent. That's awesome. That's <laughs> that's the great. Yeah, yeah. That's really wonderful. I, I'd be. I'm going to be thrilled if I even get one of my kids into the seminary, much less through to ordination. So that's uh, that's absolutely wonderful. Um, so. Um, what and what was it that was it just being involved in these movements that you made you want to become a priest or was there <clears throat> excuse me another factor involved um i suppose uh, growing up in a fairly uh, fertile ground for the catholic faith i thought about it but it was really this new movement this faith movement which i'm sure you haven't heard about but it's um has a very deep it tries to connect uh, reason and faith, science and religion, and uh, um, has this deep understanding of who Jesus is. And it's very compelling. And a lot of the men went off to be priests. Um, we have a very high vocation rate. And uh, I think that's really, I just really, really believed in, in Jesus and the Catholic faith. And I just thought, well, you know, why not follow him, you know? So, that's all. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's uh, what someone has once said something to the effect of, um, you know, you, you follow Christ, aim for sainthood, because um, the alternative is not good. <laughs> so that's great. You're you, you're working that way. You're way down that road. That's awesome. So yeah. tell us, uh, be, tell us a little bit about Teresa Higginson. Why is it that she is? Um, well, uh, most people will never have heard of her, unfortunately, and uh, that's a shame because based on the research I've been doing, uh, again, I'm surprised she's not already a saint or at least isn't better known. So d let me go ahead and just stop, step back and allow you to uh, take over here for a little while and tell us her okay, story. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about her and her life. Um, yeah, so at one point in England, everybody was very aware of her in the 1930s they're all trying to canonize her all the school teachers um mm. but it you know i'll explain why it sort of faded away um and uh yeah i think i agree with you her time is coming that we've got to try and get a proclaimed a saint 
And her spiritual director for the last 22 years of her life, Canon Snow, um, after she died, said that he thought she was not only a saint, but one of the greatest saints God had ever raised up in his church. And uh, uh, yeah, she's a very intriguing character. So outwardly very ordinary life, but inwardly extraordinary. Um, so her, her parents were, um, uh, her, her father met her mother in Ireland um, after her pretty dramatic conversion. And they moved to Gainsborough in the east of England. And uh, he was in charge of the canals there. And they had quite a big house, I think. Um, this was only 15 years after Catholic emancipation. And there right. was an oratory there. So a lot of the Catholics would gather in their house, local Catholics. Teresa, um, I think, was the third of nine children. And when her mother was pregnant, she got ill and went to visit the shrine of um, St. Winifred in, in North Wales. And that's where Teresa was born on the 27th of May, 1844. And uh, she, uh, they, they grew up in, obviously in Gainsborough. Um, as I said, their house seemed to be a sort of focus for the local Catholics. So um, blessed Dominic Barbary, who famously received Cardinal John Henry, St. John Henry Newman into the church, was a visitor and he baptized her older sister. And um, also uh, Father Ignatius Spencer, who's an ancestor of um, Prince William and Prince Harry. He used to visit too, and he used to call her Teresa his little apostle because of the way she tried to spread his league for the conversion of England. And she records how her parents brought her up to have an awareness of Jesus by her side. And they had a great love for the poor. They'd feed those who come to the house every day. Um, and she talks about her own, her own um, life a little bit later. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a, a little bit about that later. Okay. Uh, she had quite a strong personality. She somehow managed to um, attract people to her and get and get them to do what she wanted in a good way anyway when she was about 10 the bishop advised that she goes to boarding school and um she didn't she found that hard to begin with and then about 11 years later she left and went to visit father ignatius who told her that god had special designs on her soul and that she must be very faithful to him or her damnation will be very bad, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and um, it was about this time, 1871, that there was a, a smallpox and cholera outbreak. I mean, that, we think about COVID, but I mean, that must have been frightening. And uh, the teacher of uh, the priest of a, a school in the northwest of England, Father uh, Powell, um, was looking for a teacher in his school and he looked to the local college and they didn't have anyone but they recommended the sister of one of their former students Teresa and she jumped at the chance of going somewhere do a bit of something a bit heroic and uh, she went off to to Father Powell's school and he encouraged her to get her teacher training certificate and she settled in and it was about this time that people began to notice things about her. So um, she would fall into fits or, you know, as we realize now, ecstasies. Um, she'd seem to survive on up to three days at a time on the Blessed Sacrament. Um, she seemed to be able to heal some of the children just by rubbing lard on them or something. Um, all, all sorts of little amazing things. I mean, she could if the fire went out, she'd make the sign of the cross over it and it would burst into flame again. If, um, if they ran out of soap, she would put the money down and suddenly the soap would appear. You know? um, she seemed to have this ability to um, read people's thoughts and to know things that had gone on um, in a nice way too, so she could encourage people. And uh, so, yeah, um, her parish priest at the time, um, wrote to the seminary to get a bit of advice and they advised that 
uh, he starts inflicting trials on her to test her obedience. And so um, uh, about this time also, um, the devil became fairly active in her life, you know, as he often did with uh, the Curie of Ars and uh, Padre Pio. And so there'd be great thumps and thuds and shrieks from her room and the sounds of um, children's voices crying in the locked up school at night and things like that. But, uh, you know, um, so yes, people were noticing these things about her. Um, but later that year, she, she uh, got quite ill and went home and she resigned her teaching post, I think partly because of all the trials that were being inflicted on her. And she got a very exemplary testimonial from her parish priest. But uh, she then, a few years later, applied for another teaching job. And um, she couldn't get communion. So uh, something extraordinary happened. She used to start having these mystical communions. So people would sometimes notice the Blessed Sacrament appear in the air and alight on her tongue. And uh, anyway, her health broke down again. She went home again. And her spiritual director, Father Powell, asked her under obedience, commanded her to write about her spiritual life. And so she wrote these 125 letters to him. Um, which cost her a lot of pain. She didn't want to talk about herself. She's extremely um, self-effacing. And it was about this time she begins to talk about the devotion to the wisdom of Christ, the sacred head of Christ. And uh, um, so, uh, yeah, um, she went back to school in Father Powell's school. And some of the priests began to notice these things going on and investigated her. There was a, a Monsignor Weld who looked into her and found was very impressed by her. Um, there was uh, Father Hall, who was Benedictine. And he was, to begin with, quite interested and quite, um, interest, quite keen on her. And then he, turned, he totally turned against her was very anti her and I think partly this was because of um, the reports of her bilocations which were pretty I mean if you read about them now they're pretty extraordinary by any stretch of the imagination so anyway as a result of all this the bishop ordered that she change her spiritual director which must have been quite a shock for her quite a challenge indeed yes but they got, um, they found a priest who turned out to be providential, Canon Snow, who really cared for her. And he took an, made an investigation of mystical theology so he could guide her. And then after a few different posts in different schools, she received this incredible grace from God, which is the, um, the mystical marriage. Um, She'd already received the stigmata some years before. Um, and I mean, I didn't know what the mystical marriage was. I mean, I'm not yeah, sure. why don't you? A lot of people won't have uh, any, yeah. will never have even heard the phrase before. Why don't, can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so I mean, she uh, earlier in her life, she'd, as I said, she'd received the stigmata after. Okay. She, Which are the then, wounds of Christ. The wounds right? of Christ in her hands and her feet and her head. And she, this really troubled her. She didn't want any outward display. She was very humble. Uh, so she begged God to take away the, the appearance of it, just to give her the pain. And it seemed that this was preparing her for another grace, which was the mystical espousals that she received in Sa Feast of the Sacred Heart, 1874. And as I say, a few years later, 1887, this grace is um, the mystical marriage when... Well, she, she writes about it in obedience to her spiritual director. The whole court of heaven was present and God united her soul to his. And it seems it's the highest union that any human being can have with God in this life. So although you can carry on being growing in holiness, 
Um, it's the highest union you, you can have, and it's very rare. And uh, after this time, all the outward extraordinary things around it disappeared. It just seemed very ordinary again. And uh, Canon Snow um, managed to find her a place. His sister was the superior of the convent in, uh, in Edinburgh, in Scotland. And she was able to go and live there for 12 years without any questions asked. And she carried on helping in the parishes there. Then she came back to her home in Neston in the Wirral. And a parish priest, uh, her friend, Father Powell, asked her to, to act as a nurse to the sister of his head teacher. She did for three or four years. She went on a pilgrimage to Rome, met the, had an audience with Pope Leo XIII. And by this stage, she was in her late 50s, and she thought she'd try and get a um, final teaching job. So she applied um, to uh, Lord Clifford's estate down in Devon, very, very remote rural spot, way down in my diocese, actually, down in the southwest of England. And she arrived in the dark, in the pouring rain, this very remote schoolhouse, which is infested with rats. Mm. And she soon turned it round. She had this amazing influence on children who absolutely adored her. And um, she was there for two years, uh, um, looking after the, the uh, children of the workers on this estate. And then um, she was coming home for the Christmas holidays and she had a stroke. So they drafted in a Catholic nurse to come and look after her and who was very, very influenced by her in that short time, went off to become a nun. And then Teresa died on the uh, 15th of February, 1905. And uh, she's buried up in Neston in the Wirral. Um, now, where is that if, if uh, you know, so most Americans and maybe most English speaking people who are watching this have an idea of the shape of England. Uh, yeah. Where would Neston be in terms of, say, you know, London would be kind of more in the south of the of the country. Yeah. Uh, then the, you know, there's Manchester and Liverpool. I mean, she lived in Liverpool for a while, didn't she? That's right. So is Neston, is, is Neston up by there on the, what, yeah. on the west coast up toward the middle of the country? That's right. More or less. Trouble okay. England, actually. But yes, she, she ended up, that was right. That was, um, so on a clock face, it's about... Uh, 10 o'clock, I suppose. So it's okay. That's a great way of looking at it. I've never thought of doing it that way. That's wonderful. Okay. 10 o'clock. And uh, yeah, so um, basically uh, in 1937, uh, they tried to open her cause for canonization. Mm -hmm. And then we went to Rome. And as I say, all the school teachers were, you know, drafted in to pray and and then, um, strangely, they got this report back in 1938 saying, no, it's not going to go any further with it. Now, they didn't shut the cause. They could have just said, no, it's, we can't do it because she's obviously not a saint. They didn't do that. What they did is they shelved it, uh, which is curious. And we never yes, really why, do you have any idea why? Well, it got out through, I don't know whether it was... You know how things leak out of Rome when they should. Of shouldn't. course. <laughs> We've never heard that happen before, have we? Never, never. So they think it was to do with the devotion to the Sacred Head because it apparently went from the Congregation of Saints to the Congregation for the, the Holy Office, which was what we call the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Right. And there seemed to be some issue with the devotion to the Sacred Head, that there were many devotions to our Lord at that time, something like that. Anyway, um, so it's been on hold, her cause. And, and just so people who are watching can understand, the the Vatican is, of course, um, you know, it's it's where the Pope governs. It's the place from which the, the Pope governs the church. 
But helping him do that are these offices, what they call dicasteries, congregations. There are congregations, there uh, are offices, there are these different um, units below the Pope uh, through which he governs the church. And, you know, there's the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, which I explained in the pilot episode, is where uh, they kind of go through and they sift through all the information for the saint, but then... Uh, and then they make recommendations as to whether or not someone should go forward in the beatification and or canonization process. And then the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, the Holy Office, the Office of the Inquisition way back when, uh, it's the office charged with keeping, um, making sure that the faith is passed on uh, in uh, with all of its integrity, that uh, heresy and... and um, uh, and that sort of thing, or even just, you know, things that are not wholly Catholic, uh, where, you know, they kind of keep a watch on that. And so you're saying that the the devotion to the sacred head went to there, and they said, that, piff, there's already too many devotions out there, or we already have enough devotions in any case, so let's move on. Yeah, it's kind of weird, isn't it? So we never... Really it is. Well, especially when you consider that, you know, our Lord, I was reading some of the, the, the revelations about the um, devotion to the sacred head. And our Lord, um, you know, according to her private revelation, said to her, whoever helps me promote this, helps you promote <laughs> this, is going to be blessed a thousandfold. But woe to him who, you know, it's almost like, woe, you know, better for that man that he had never been born type yeah. thing. Right, she says he'll be like an egg smashed against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you think about that from, a, from an eternal perspective, uh, that's not a very pleasant uh, image that that conjures up, is it? No, no, indeed, indeed. But, I mean, uh, she was she, uh, it, taken out of context. That makes her sound pretty scary, but she was very far from that. She was very um, likable. I mean, the, we have the um, reports about her, and she was an extremely um, likable, sweet, charming person who was vivacious, who loved conversation, um, who loved people. So um, very humble. You, get, you really get that sense looking at the few photographs that we have of her. Uh, it's not like they're going to fill a full photo album. I think I've seen uh, four of them, and that may be the entire range. Who knows? But we, there's one where she's a young woman and she's smiling. Uh, there's another one where she's a, a kind of this tiny little old lady, it looks like. And uh, she just looks as sweet as the day is long. And uh, mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you really get that sense. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Continue. Yeah, no, that's right. Well, anyway, the postscript to all this is that last year, our English bishops were, uh, the Archbishop of Liverpool was sort of um, prompted to approach Rome about her cause again. By, oh, wonderful. Yeah, by um, a very dynamic and single-minded retired banker. Um, and he did all the hard work. And um, so it all went to Rome because there had been a major miracle. There'd been a major miracle recently. And um, shall I tell you about the major miracle? Please, uh, this is the first time I'm hearing about it, so I'm excited. No, please, go right ahead. I love uh, this stuff. Please, I, Yeah, so basically there was, a, I think it was in 2001, um, there was a, a, a farmer, a pea farmer, actually, in Hull. Mm -hmm. And he, I hope I'm allowed to tell you about this. I don't think I'm not. Um, he developed throat cancer. And he went in to have a scan in one of these big rooms of these big machines, you know. And the nurse said, and this is where I go out and press the button. So he, she practiced going out, you know. And he looked, he, he, by, standing by his bed suddenly was this woman who he later described as a cross between um, Queen Victoria and old Mother Shipton. And she said, the Our Father... And then he looked and she'd gone and the nurse had come back in. Anyway, he was telling his wife about this. He said, you'll think I'm absolutely crazy. And she just looked at him and she took her prayer card out of her pocket and said, did she look like this? And he said, yes, that was her. That was her. He said, it was Teresa Hickinson. She'd been praying to her. Anyway, the point is that he had a complete 
instantaneous cure. Now, throat cancer, I believe, is pretty aggressive, and the other people um, in the same ward had all died, apparently. He's still alive. So it all went to Rome. The parish priest signed it all, and it all went to Rome. The doctors signed that it was miraculous. And so, anyway, this all went to Rome and um, last year, and it seems, again, that they were very impressed in Rome about this, impressed about the her holiness. Again, it seems it's gone to the congregation of the doctrine of the faith, and it came back with the same uh, basic report as in 1937, something along the lines, we haven't yet got any evidence to overturn what we said before, which is, mm. I know, I find it curious, you know. I, I feel that we're not really pushing it enough. We're not, <laughs> you know, I feel that the people in Rome will, you know, you've got to ask them the right questions. We haven't really been single-minded enough somehow. It, I don't know. it does seem odd. I mean, if if the objection before truly was we already have enough devotions and we don't want to encourage anything else, in the post-conciliar era, um, you know, I read that it was uh, the devotions really fell out of favor. Even something like what your family did is remarkable, even more the more even more so remarkable that they were praying the rosary on a daily basis uh, together as a family because that fell out of um, uh, out of favor with a lot of Catholics. Unfortunately, um, the Sacred Heart devotion, while it's still very well known, uh, is not. Uh, you know, you don't have Sacred Heart Leagues or these sorts of things. Sodalities, uh, you know, I had to, when I first started learning about sodalities in the, uh, the late 90s, I had to look up what that me meant because as a lifelong cradle Catholic, I had never heard the word. Of course, I never heard the word transubstantiation either, but you know, that's a different story for a different day. So, you know, it's, uh, it. And especially because, you know, it's it's odd. I was thinking about this a little bit um, because when, when you have, okay, so we're thinking about the sacred head of Jesus being the source of all divine wisdom, um, <clears throat> which I, I think to the average modern ear, uh, maybe even to an antiquarian ear, uh, would sound a little bit unusual and um what do we make of this sort of thing whereas uh when but when you start thinking about it uh it was his head that was pierced for our sins uh you know with the crown of thorns um and when he is um pierced when his when his head has has the crown of thorns imposed upon it what is his reaction does he and they're buffeting that sacred head with blows? Scripture tells us, and spitting on that sacred head. What is his reaction? Is it to do like I would do, or maybe and maybe even you would do, and just hey, well, look at I'm your creator. How dare you do this to me? No, it's a absolute and utter utter silence. Um, Saint Paul in First Corinthians goes into uh, goes very much in depth into the fact that uh, you know divine wisdom is not human wisdom. Uh, scripture tells us, my ways are not your ways, uh, and, and, and on and on down the, the line. And so when you think about the, when you start unpacking the devotion of, to the sacred heart, a sacred head of the divine, as the seed of divine wisdom, it becomes almost the, the most commonsensical thing in the world, as if, well, of course, why wouldn't you have this sort of devotion? I mean, we have a devotion to the shoulder wound of Christ uh, Padre Pio, whose the feast it is today, the, on the day that we're recording this, um, you know, had a very big devotion to the shoulder wound of Christ. Mm. Um, so, you know, in in saying that there are too many devotions, it almost would be like saying there are too many blessings or graces from God to get us to heaven, uh, which would be the most absurd thing in the world, I think. So, um, I don't know. Is what what do you understand of it that? Um, that might help the people who are either watching this or the people in Rome maybe understand the situation a little bit better. Yeah, indeed. So um, this is business is the sacred head. When I, and when you first hear it, it makes you laugh. You think, oh, sacred head, you know. It's, it's sort of right. hard, 
appeals to you because everybody even if you don't believe in God the hearts you know valentines all the rest of it the heart symbolizes love well um you know the sacred head can I just read a little bit here please um, no go right ahead I love this so she talks about one of her visions here to her spiritual director I was considering the excessive love of the sacred heart and offering to my divine, divine spouse the same love to make amends for our coldness and his constancy and infinite riches to make up for our poverty and misery. When our divine Lord suddenly re represented to me the divinity as a very large, bright crystal stone in which all things are reflected or are, past, present and to come, and in such a manner that all things are present in him, this immense precious stone sent forth streams of richly coloured lights, brighter beyond comparison than 10,000 suns, which I understood represented the infinite attributes of God. This great jewel also seemed to be covered with innumerable eyes, which I understood represented the wisdom and knowledge of God. Our blessed Lord showed me this divine wisdom, as I was saying, as the guiding power which regulated the motions and affections of the Sacred Heart, showing me that it had the same effect and power over its least action and raising it as the sun draws up the vapour from the ocean. He gave me to understand that an especial devotion and veneration should be paid to the Sacred Head of our Lord as the seat of divine wisdom and guiding power of the Sacred Heart and so complete that heavenly devotion. So it's not really quite like the wound of the, the shoulder. It's not like a physical thing. It's more the head as a symbol, a symbolic uh, shrine of the powers of Christ, his, his memory, his understanding, his will, his holy soul that um, guide his love. So um, in a very modern sense, we, we talk about the powers of the brain, you know, um, and... I think uh, she was shown that this was for a time of crisis in the church, you know, and in the world when people, there'd be great confusion, intellectual confusion. And, you know, isn't that true of our time? Isn't it absolutely true when people do things in the name of love, which we know are not love? Um, you know, people are just confused about what love means. And so we need that true wisdom, that guiding power to bring us back on track, you know, and this is very, very apposite, really. Um, well, yeah, so, it's, it strikes me that Adam and Eve, if we go back to the creation, <clears throat> uh, will and intellect were perfectly yoked. They're perfectly joined together until the fall. And then it becomes a situation where, you know, the heart is willing, but the flesh is weak. Um, you know, St. Paul talks about, I do the things I do not want to do. His uh, intellect is not able to overcome his passions. Uh, and I, yeah, how, I think so many of us can identify with that. Um, and it seems to me, I hear, what I hear you saying is that the devotion to the sacred head as the seat of divine wisdom is a way of inching ourselves back to that kind of the intellect uh, and the will being more fully yoked so that we can be, grow in holiness through Jesus Christ. Is that, or is it, am I missing the mark? No, I think, I know what you're saying. I think there is, it is an antidote to our sinful wounded nature that is out of kilter, if you like, as St. Paul says in Romans. Um, so we do the things we don't want to do. Um, but I think it, even before that, uh, that we need wisdom, it's essential, it's essential to everything. We know it from looking around in every creature. Every, I mean, the modern science shows the way every single little creature or plant has an environment that directs it, that gives it what it needs. Um, and our environment is not... The world around us, it's God himself, it's Jesus. We need that wisdom. We need him as you know, spiritual beings. We need that uh, sunshine to our spiritual lives. And that is Jesus. And we need his sacred head to guide us. Even if we haven't sinned, we still need it. And that's another subject. <laughs>
Now, there's something that um, really struck me in researching her life, and that is that she had her first spiritual experience when she was three years old. Yeah. As the father of several children, uh, my children when they were three were, you know, of course, remarkable in my eyes, probably not as to in anyone else's, but certainly to my eyes, they were remarkable. But I can tell you right now, none of them, uh, you know, they might try to genuflect and make the sign of the cross or something like this in imitation of what their parents were doing. I mean, they always wanted to dip their hands into the holy water font, but to have an experience of the Trinity, which is, if memory serves, is what happened to her at three years old, is pretty remarkable. What what was there about that? I know, I find that a bit, you know, it's one of those things about her life that are a little bit hard to take. She, in fact, I think she might have been four, actually. Maybe she was three. She went into her oratory in her house, and I think it was... Cumbrook feast day, one of the feast days, and she offered herself to the Trinity. It might have been the feast of the Trinity. She gave herself to the Trinity her whole life, um, and she felt that God had accepted her offering and given her some understanding of the Trinity. Now, I mean, I can't even remember anything before my fourth birthday, and you know, I don't think I, God really featured at all until I was much older. I just very boring, ordinary life. I find that quite challenging, but she she was quite precocious. She was uh, uh, definitely um, a remarkable, very bright. I think she must have been very bright. Um, um, I, I think uh, we can say that there were signs that she had to struggle. She wasn't a saint overnight in the sense that, although... I don't know if I can say this to you. I think this might be a bit shocking to your readers, but uh, the story of her sin, her first sin. Um, hmm. You heard that one about... No, her. no, I've not. All oh, right. Well, she had gone out for a walk with her family. She's a little girl. She'd gone out for a walk. And when they got back home, her mother asked her to hang up her coat. And she pretended not to hear. She disobeyed her. And she regarded this as a great sin, this offense of disobedience that plagued her for the rest of her life. And her spiritual directors recognized, reckoned that that was the only sin in her whole life, the only <laughs> sin in her life. Can you believe it? That's, although she went to confession, they reckon after she died, they couldn't think of anything that was sinful. So, um, yeah, she, uh, she did things that weren't always wise. She used to um, uh, inflict quite severe penances on herself as a girl growing up. You know, she would trap her fingers in the door and she would um, put drop hot coals on herself. And because she seemed to have this uh, burning love for Jesus that needed to be assuaged. And um, I think some people say, well, was she self-harming? Was she self-harming? I don't think she was. Um, she wasn't. She had no negative sense about herself. It wasn't a sort of self hatred in any way. Um, and she used to uh, sometimes take punishment for other children's faults and crimes and naughty behaviour. And she realises later that, you know, this is probably a bit imprudent doing all this stuff. But you know, she was only a girl, for goodness' sake. So. Yeah, she certainly had her struggles um, and her real health as well. She wasn't well a lot of the time, so it's kind of hard. But uh, yeah, um, I think she was, I think despite the fact that she um, was incredibly holy in a way that is quite hard to relate to on one level, you know, she's uh, on another level, she is a great role model because she's a very modern role model um, in the sense that she was very ordinary life. Um, she never got married or had a, a children um, or became a nun. So she was just a lay woman all her life, but a working woman. And, um, again, you know, she didn't found a religious order. 
She didn't end her life in some incredible martyrdom. Um, she, outwardly, she just had this humdrum, ordinary life, which we can relate to. And in the midst of it, she was very heroic. So she would um, very generous in her prayer. She would focus on other people. She would um, help the poor. Um, she do everything, all her duties, very carefully. And um, above all, she had this, fan, this really core cool love for Jesus, um, especially in Holy Communion. And I think you know that sort of kind of works, you know, um, as a school teacher. And uh, yeah, she had this idea of, of the wisdom of Jesus as, as the key thing for us as human beings, um, which again is pretty, pretty beautiful, pretty lovely. I've often thought that saints make other saints. If you go back through the history, uh, the biographies, hagiographies of saints, uh, you'll find it's remarkable how often um, the life of one saint intertwines very and sometimes very closely uh, with the life of another. And so, uh, you know, it's something like iron sharpening iron. Uh, and it seems like we have something similar here with the servant of God, Teresa, who knew blessed Dominic Bar um, <clears throat> Barberi and Ignatius Spencer, who is uh, who must have been a force in and he seems like he was just a, a force to, to reckon with, a, a remarkable man. Um, how did she come to know them and what did she take from her? What can you tell that she took from her relationship with them and what they did, what they may have taken from their relationship with her? Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't know anything more than her own accounts that she was forced to write about her childhood for, by a spiritual director. Okay. So I don't know anything from um, Dominic Barbary or Ignatius Spencer. However, um, I, I think it, it was in a period in England called the Second Spring when, um, uh, as I said, Catholic emancipation had just, um, you know, it was finally after all these years of centuries of persecution in 1829, it was legal to be Catholic again without, you know, priests could actually practice. And we had this flood of priests coming into England and religious orders and, um, you know, the Passionists and the Rosminians and the founding of, I mean, Pugin, who, um, who built the Houses of Parliament, who built all these lovely churches. Uh, so, you know, Catholic influence suddenly was there and including some of these very heroic priests and missionaries, um, including Dominic Barbary and Ignatius Spencer. So I think... Um, they would have had an impact on lots of people. Um, I, I mean, there's the famous, uh, I think it's in the Office of Readings for Cardinal Newman, St. John Henry Newman's feast day. He talks about his own reception into the Catholic Church and how he met Ignat uh, Dominic Barbary walking down the road. And he said just seeing him there was so impressive. There was something about him that just warmed your heart. He just, this joy, this sense of holiness about him. So these men were, were extremely committed, dedicated, and would, would, saw England as a, as a, you know, fertile ground for, for their work. Um, you know, it's... And, uh, and it's not, it, would, it could not have been easy for them. I mean... Uh, the the Duke of Wellington, who was prime minister for uh, a while, uh, and then his successor, um, Lord Robert Peel, uh, who was always so reflexively, I read the other day, was so reflexively um, anti-Catholic, pro-Protestant, that they would call him Orange Peel, because, you know, orange being the color <laughs> of the, yeah, orange being the color of, uh, of, of the Protestant movement. Um, and, you know, there was, um, you know, Ignatius Spencer getting an audience with Queen Victoria and basically saying, you need to come into the Catholic Church, um, uh, which she kind of humored him, as you might uh, imagine. You can probably imagine the look on her, on her face uh, <laughs> after being told by this by some priest that she doesn't know. Um, 
but it was it wasn't as though the the act of emancipation was signed and 15 years later when Teresa is born uh, the English public has become all embracing of Catholics and saying come on in and we're sorry for uh, lopping off your heads so many years ago and things like this uh, it was still very very I mean to be seen as British was uh, almost by definition to not be Catholic yeah, uh, and to be anti-Catholic in a certain sense. So uh, it could not, you know, this milieu in which she grew up with uh, or amidst which she grew up could not have been an easy one in terms of practicing one's faith. And here it is, you have Dominic Barberi and uh, Ignatius Spencer coming in and saying, we're going to convert England back to the true faith. Um, it, uh uh, you know, I, I can only imagine that, that, that their example would have been at least uh, highly edifying for her if, if, if no other impact would have uh, been felt. Yes, indeed. I think um, we've got to try and imagine what it was like um, being in that family home when, uh, you know, her parents would have. I mean, for example, her mother was Irish. Um, there was a great immigration into England of Irish people who were seen as um, well, you know, f strange, foreign, exotic, Catholic faith, you know, it wasn't English. Um, that's been there for us, you know, for a long time. It was there. Um, and, um, you know, just the fact of being Catholic in that area would have been strange. Um, so, yes, she would have felt different. However, um, she had a very limited circle. So her family was big. We're told she didn't have out outside friends. So she probably only knew her brothers and sisters. She went to board, a Catholic boarding school. So again, this fairly limited environment. Um, it probably wasn't until she, she went to Bootle and Liverpool that she began to really encounter. Um, and again, it was probably a fairly limited circle, Catholic schools, you know. So, um, yeah, she, but um, I think she, uh, she, as I say, she's very bright. She kept up with the news and she would have been very aware of the milieu in which she was living, definitely. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, yeah. We should talk a little bit about uh, the fact that um, the revelation, you know, for those who don't understand the nature of the types of revelation that she received, um, even if the church were to uh, beatify her or canonize her at some point, it wouldn't necessarily mean that the church was putting its stamp of approval and saying that the revelation she received was, in fact, divine revelation. It would be just like Fatima. is a It's a private revelation, Lord's. Their private revelations. Can you speak a little bit about the difference between divine revelation and uh, private revelation? Yeah, of course. So revelation is the revealing of God's truth to us uh, or a, an unfolding of mysteries to us. And um, so there are two main types is public and private. Um, public revelation is the message of Jesus Christ, the saving gospel which we believe ended with the death of the last apostle. And we need that to be saved. We need the public revelation of Jesus Christ. There's no two ways about it. Um, after that, there can be private revelations when God speaks to saints or visionaries, um, apparitions of Our Lady, for example, at Lourdes, as you say, Fatima. Um, these are not necessary for publics for salvation, you know, in the sense that we've got all we need from Jesus Christ already. However, they can be necessary, they can be important in, in guiding the church back on, if it's sort of got slightly, needs a bit of a push in the right direction, or if um, individuals need a push in the right direction. So, um, although we're never obliged to believe in the private revelation by the church, um, nevertheless, they can have uh, an important role for, for us. So, for example, we think about the devotion to the heart of Christ, the Sacred Heart. Um, you know, the Saint Margaret Mary Alicot uh, had these visions of Jesus, in which he revealed his heart as the as the love, uh, the symbol of his love 
for human beings. However, even there, the devotion to the heart of Christ had been around for centuries, so it wasn't anything new. But so this devotion to the sacred head, um, these, these visions that, she, that Teresa had, so if she was canonized, I think they probably would need to be accepted and understood. However, I don't think God would say you need to believe in them to understand the basic message, which is that um, it's, you know, this, the beginning of St. John's Gospel is the Logos, the wisdom, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. It, Jesus is the wisdom of God um, to bring us light and truth. And Teresa's mission was to try and point us back to that in an era when we have got so utterly confused and blinded and darkened that we can even, you know, kill people prematurely in the name of love. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> it's, uh, um, so, yeah, it's, uh, um, it's that private. Re that's what private revelation is, basically. Yeah. Well, and you have, a, it sounds like there's a similarity between the servant of God, Teresa, and um, St. Faustina, uh, who also had revelations uh, that were not just um, seen as being insignificant, but seen as being very, very, because of a bad translation into Italian, uh, were seen as being, you know, wholly scandalous in, cer in certain circles, and they were banned. Um, and it was due to, from what I, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the good offices of then Cardinal Carol Wojtyla uh, to, you know, to make sure that there was a good translation that was uh, implemented, that was made of, of the revelations so that the divine mercy uh, devotion could become more greatly known and practiced. And now it's a universal feast in the church. And uh, according to Teresa, uh, our Lord wanted the, what is, I think, the first Friday after the uh, Feast of the Sacred Heart to be the um, Feast of the Sacred Head. So, um, you know, it, it, there's still hope. <laughs> um, but, she, you know, she has so much in common with uh, Teresa Newman, Mary of Agreda, uh, as you mentioned, St. Margaret Mary, and Catherine Emmerich. And, and, you know, they have all, all of them have this, great wide fame and have brought many souls to salvation in Christ. Uh, and, you know, and again, here is uh, in Mary of Agreda, she's still just venerable. She's not blessed Mary of Agreda. She's just venerable Mary of Agreda. And yet so many people draw inspiration and wisdom in following Christ through her, uh, through the revelations that she put down on paper. Um, and again, there's the fact that Teresa Higginson is so practically unknown. Uh, it's just, it blows my mind. It's hard to understand. Yeah, that's right. It's right. Well, you see, she, she uh, had this picked up from Jesus. He was really, really keen that his wisdom be on it. You said it would, it would come. It would bring great glory to the church. Uh, it would bring the faith back to England, basically. And she kept asking, when will it come? When will this devotion be known? When, when, when? He'd never tell her when it would be. He never, ever told her. But he did say, well, first, encourage people to say the rosary because there has to come a deeper understanding of the incarnation. That has to come first. That's very interesting. And um, Profound. So so, so yes, so this deeper understanding of God, of why God had become human, why he had to become human, that has to come into the church first uh, before this devotion can be promoted. And, and so maybe, as you rightly say, very similar to St. Faustina, um, she prophesied that the whole devotion would be as though dead, and that eventually a spark would come from Poland to set it alight again. And um, sure enough, Pope John Paul was the one, as Cardinal Watiwa, who, uh, who looked into it all and said, look, this is ridiculous. Of course it's right. Get it going again. And he got her canonized. Um, so, um, yeah. And, and um, there, I mean, there, there's a lot more I could say on that because the, the uh, youth movement, that, that the new movement that I encountered in Scotland was founded by a priest whose mother had... Um, a series of supernatural experiences 
linked to Theresa Higginson, actually, and uh, um, that Theresa appeared to this priest when he was a little boy, and, and basically there was a strong link between this, this uh, deeper understanding of the incarnation and the faith movement, which is where so many priests have got their priesthood from. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. There's, there's a link there. I won't go into it, but it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it has a mission. This mo new movement has a mission to bring this deeper understanding of Jesus to the world uh, for the greater glory of the church. And I think in time it will come. It will come. It's very exciting. <laughs> Father, we're coming close to the end of our time together. Are there any final thoughts that you would want to leave the audience with? Uh, in terms of Teresa Higginson and how she can help them grow in their walk with Christ? Um, yeah, well, uh, I would say just try praying to her because she does I hear your prayers. There's many, many examples of wonderful things that have happened when you try praying to her, asking for her help. She's very accessible, uh, very sweet person, you know, when you read about her. Um, um, I think her basic mission is to to bring the church back on track. She her her thing, the devotion to the Sacred Head, um, was for this time that we're living in now. If we get confused about all the battles going on in the church, even at the highest level, well, she foresaw it all. She says, "Look, there is an antidote. We we will come through it. We will regain certainty again. We will come back to to Jesus." And uh, so she she helps bring encouragement. And I think also um, she she, if you like, proves the reality of the supernatural. She says, look, yes, God is real. The sacraments are real. The blessed sacrament is real, really is Jesus. So what you're doing is right. Stay on track. I think that's an important message for us as Catholics today. Indeed. Father, as a final thought, would you give us your blessing, please? Oh, <laughs> does that work across the Atlantic? I, 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 well, we'll trust. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I want to say thank you very much for asking me to do this. So I'm very impressed by your, all you're doing. It's, it's really quite astonishing. Uh, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, send his holy angels to watch over you, guide you in his wisdom and love. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord indeed. Thank you, Father. We really appreciate you being with us. God bless you, Brian. God, God bless, bless you.